What a beautiful day today, and I know that you enjoyed resting, and thank you for being here tonight. We're going to have a celebration. Uh, it's not a normal uh, gathering type uh, with a message or teaching. We're just going to celebrate tonight. I want to draw our thoughts together about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this festival for this time. Uh, the scriptures say that we're to call a holy convocation. I don't think that's for teaching or for learning. That's for us to gather together and to have a commitment with God. To work on our relationship with Him. So during this evening, I'm going to remind us of a few things that we've learned. But basically, we're just going to worship Him. We're going to make a commitment. We're going to have a, a time for... Uh, just commitment that you may want to come and, and pray and gather together with others and pray um, in a few minutes. But I want you just to let your minds be open to where we're going. And that is to draw nigh to Him. Just to come to Him today. Submitting these next days as days that will become... Um, or instill in our lives a habit of every day getting the leaven out of our lives, getting the sin out of our lives. You know, it, it takes a number of days, and different people say different time frames, to form a, a habit. I'm not sure that it does, that bad habits don't come quicker than good habits, but I know that it, it takes a number of days for you to, to get a habit. But I think that if we, if we set aside these seven days or eight days, really, and be very sincere and concentrate on what God's doing in our lives, spend some extra time in God's Word and say, Search me, God. Search my heart. Show me where I need to change. Give me the strength and the wisdom and the courage to change. If we do that for eight days straight, we'll be on the right path. We'll be headed in the right direction. We will make some corrections, all of us. And God will show us where we need to go. I want us to begin with reading a portion of Psalm 118. Um, we've studied and realized that as the pilgrims went, not the American pilgrims, but those in Israel went to the feasts, uh, the travel days, that they recited the Psalms, a group of Psalms. This is one of the last ones, or maybe the last one, as they would get to Jerusalem and go through the gates, Psalm 118. And I want us to look at a little bit of that this evening and allow it to do some, some teaching and recalling in our minds. I'm going to read uh, the first part of it. And uh, the second verse and third and fourth verses say, Let Israel say, and then you're going to read the part of that, His faithful love endures forever. And that we repeat that three different times. It's Israel and it's Aaron and, uh, and it's those who fear the Lord. That's us. We're just going to start with that tonight. So join with me as we read. And let's all read the first verse together and then I'll say, let Israel say. Together with me. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let Israel say, Let the house of Aaron say, Let those who fear the Lord say, Say it one more time. His faithful love endures forever. Let's pray. Father, as we begin this evening of praise, we are just reminded that your faithful love endures forever. We praise you, Lord, for that. We know that you are unending and that you are unchanging. So, Father, we just look to you as the standard for what you're teaching us and the, and the direction that you're taking us. Lord, I just ask that this evening may be an evening 
that produces a sweet aroma for you. That as we lift our voices and as our hearts are challenged to be drawn to you, that you will be ever present in our midst. That your Holy Spirit will touch our lives. That you will change us. Father, we desire to have a closer relationship day in and day out. And you've given us this feast for us to examine ourselves and to get the sin out of our lives. To change some of the habits that we have. To get our direction upon the right path. So Father, I just ask that you give us direction this evening. Even as we celebrate your greatness. This we pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. And we humbly say, Amen. Our dancers are going to begin with a celebration. I want you to have freedom just to worship tonight. Then our praise team is going to come and we're going to have some great music just for praise. And you can join us as we worship together. Come on, dancers.
Heavenly Father, praise you for the hearts of these women, Father, who just long to please you in the dance. And they move us closer to you, Father, with their love for you. In Yeshua's name, amen.
let the love one more time who comes in the name of the Praise you, Father.
Holy One Who was and is and is to come Yes, we raise up hope Yes, who was and is and is to come. Who was? Who is? Yes, who was and is and is to come. Praise you, Father. Anybody with a shofar out there? <laughs> Get ready. Let them rip.
praise you, Father. You may be seated. That left me kind of breathless. How about you? Uh, I'm not sure that everyone knows, but that's a song that Greg has written. It's a, a beautiful song. It tells us and reminds us that uh, he's coming. He's coming soon. I wanted to share with you just a couple of thoughts this evening and try to bring that to uh, a conclusion very quickly here because we want to just praise and worship and, and worship the Lord. I've learned several things in this year's study and coupling those with some from uh, years before have helped me maybe uh, stabilize a little bit more about where we are and what we're doing in the walk and understand that that the scriptures are just incredible. Uh, the more you study and the more little things that you pull out of there, uh, it, just, it just boggles your mind of how God put all this together. Now, we're wrapped up now in the Exodus story because that set the stage, or at least for our understanding, that set the stage for the story. And that is the Redeemer. Uh, the redemption by the blood. But it became uh, introduced to man, at least I believe, in the Exodus in Egypt. So as the, uh, the children of Israel were living in Canaan and they were prospering and they were doing well until they got distracted. And God saw um, the people turning their hearts from Him and you know it, it's, it's impossible for me to, uh, to think about how God might have thought because he knew all this. It was his plan from the very beginning. He had already experienced it. But as we walk through it and it unfolds for us, we have to look at it from our perspective. God sent Joseph to Egypt way ahead of time to get him ready. And it wasn't a very fun assignment. And I'm sure he didn't understand what it was about. But Joseph plays a very integral part in establishing all. If Joseph hadn't have been the man that, that followed God and was consistent, the Exodus story wouldn't have happened. Now, that's from a human standpoint. God could have done it any way he wanted to, but he knew that Joseph was the man. And he sent him there. And Joseph became second in power. We, we know the story about Joseph. Joseph's last requests were, when you leave here, take my bones. Okay? And he died, and he was buried, and that time passed. And the children of Israel cried out, and they cried out more, and slavery became worse, and, and it, it, was, it was an awful, awful situation. God heard their cry and prepared the Redeemer, which is the picture of Messiah. And there's, you can just go through step after step after step in Moses' life and how they parallel with uh, Yeshua. We, we don't have time for that. I want to look at Joseph for a minute. Joseph, dead, buried. God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, let the people go. Now, that's our phrase, and we got songs and all that kind of stuff. It hadn't really dawned on me in, in the fullness of it that Moses and Aaron, when they spoke to Pharaoh, were really not asking Pharaoh to release the children of Israel from slavery. I, I went back and after I listened to some teachings, I went back and I examined that. I didn't find any place where 
Moses went in to Pharaoh and said, you need to free these people. He just said, God has told us to go three days journey into the wilderness and offer sacrifices. I believe that, that uh, Pharaoh didn't want to let them go three days. He might have had thoughts that this will lead to something else, but I don't think it entered his mind that they wouldn't come back and that he would lose them as slaves. Regardless, the children of Israel left and, and the, the story says that they left from Ramesses and they went to Sukkot first day. In rabbinical teaching and uh, some secular writings, Joseph, uh, who we suspect is the Joseph uh, that is the tribe of Israel, the Joseph who went and became second in command in Egypt, was buried in Sukkot. And he had an elaborate tomb. And they called him in the writings, Joseph of Rama. Now, Rama refers to high places. Uh, Rama theme would be plural, the high places. And so in the writings, a lot of times it says Joseph of Ramathim. Joseph of the high places. High places indicate idols, idol worship. That's what Egypt was known for. Now you would have thought that Joseph would have been something from Israel, but they identified him in his tomb as Joseph from Egypt, and he was in Sukkot. I believe it's very possible that the children of Israel went to Sukkot and emptied the tomb and got Joseph's bones the first day. First thing they did, that was a promise that had been made and passed down through generations, and they went to the tomb, opened the tomb, and took the bones, and then they left. The report of the open tomb is when Pharaoh knew that he had been defeated. Now he really didn't realize or didn't follow through with accepting defeat, so he mounted his chariots and went after them. Now, in actuality, he still owned them. They still belonged. They were out in the wilderness and they were fleeing and they were headed to Mount Sinai, and they're going to the, to the land of Canaan, but they still belonged to him. That was a legal deal. So, for them to be free, he had to die. He had seen the open tomb, and now he's in pursuit, and he must die. And God does this elaborate plan of sending them. That third day, he told them to turn and go down in this wadi and go down by the Red Sea, and they were trapped in, and you know the story of crossing of the Red Sea. And it's on the third day, as the sun rises, as they've crossed the Red Sea all night, and on that third day, is when the waters come back and cover the adversary. Now, how much of a parallel is that to Yeshua? The empty tomb, when the women went to the tomb and it was empty and they came back and brought their report, that's when the adversary knew that he was defeated. But he's still in pursuit. And the sea hasn't destroyed him yet. So you see, we're still in that story. You, you see the parallels I'm, I'm looking at? I think that's just amazing. The story's not finished, but he will be destroyed. Now, that's the basis and foundation of this story. 
part of the, the traditional Seder uh, begins with the leaven. And we're told to get the leaven out of our house and all that. And then the traditional Seder, in the beginning of the evening, last evening, the 14th evening, uh, the father would take a candle and a feather and a wooden spoon. If I understand and have read correctly and people have told me correctly, he didn't take all of those. He may have designated the oldest son to carry the candle or he may have carried the candle and one of them had a feather and one of them had a spoon and one of them had a bag or a linen cloth and they went searching for linen, for the, the leaven, breadcrumbs or whatever that was left there, okay? Now what, what was their task? They were going to search for the sin, leaven. They were to put it on the wooden spoon Put it in the linen cloth or the bag. Take it outside of the house. Okay? That was the object. Now, go with me years later. Yeshua. On that same evening, was in the garden. They came searching for him with torches. They took him and put him on a wooden stake and took him outside of the camp. Amazing parallels. I don't know where the tradition began or where that started, but I see that that's, that's an amazing, amazing parallel. Joseph of Ramathaim, according to Bill Cloud, he says that if you take in Hebrew Joseph of Ramathaim and you translate that or transliterate that into Greek and then into English, you come to Joseph of Arimathea. Same word. So the Joseph of the Exodus who was buried in the tomb and the, the tomb was opened has the same name of Joseph of Arimathea who buried Yeshua in the tomb. Isn't that amazing? Now, how could that story just be so intertwined? What an amazing, amazing thing. God is so amazing and brings such revelation to us that it's just unreal. We read just a minute ago in Psalm 118. These are some of the verses that they would have been reciting as they walked, headed to Jerusalem on that last day. The day of the, the triumphal entry when Jesus went in. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let, the fear of the, let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. I can kind of imagine this group walking along, and there's a group from the tribe of Aaron, and there's a group from... And, and they're, they're doing this and chanting it, maybe, as they go along. Down in verse 14, it says... The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua. Salvation. And we know that salvation would be Yeshua. Verse 17 says, I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Uh, verse 19, open, open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Now, where are they? They're approaching Jerusalem, and they're coming to the eastern gate, and they're coming through. This is the triumphal entry, Psalm 118, as they were 
reciting these verses. Then Yeshua used these next verses in part of his teaching when he said, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. That came right out of this psalm that they were reciting that last day in coming into to, uh, Jerusalem. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord for the house of the Lord we will bless. Now when you read over in Luke and you read about the triumphal entry, what were the people saying? This verse, Psalm 118. It wasn't that that was just what happened to be on their mind. That This was part of the process, the traditional process of what they were doing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord our God, the Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. Whose bows in, with bows and hands join in the festival procession. Okay, so they had palm branches. And with the branches in their hands, they got in the procession. They're going into Jerusalem. Verse 27, the last part of it says, With bows in hand join in the festival, the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. If you don't know about the traditional practice of that day, you'd say, why are you going to go up to the horns of the altar? Tradition says that in the days of Yeshua, they took the lamb and tied it to the horns of the altar at 9 o'clock in the morning. And it stayed tied to the horns of the altar until 3 in the afternoon. Yeshua was placed on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning and died at 3 o'clock. Exactly as this psalm, Psalm 118, that they had recited over and over and over, said, You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. What an amazing God we serve. And it is our joy to be able to gather on this festival day and just praise Him. Now, I want us to take just a couple more minutes before we return to our celebration and our music. And I want us just to bow before the Lord. I want you to get serious with God and say, Okay, God, I'm coming to you at this festival day. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you may, may be able to say, I have prepared and I've gotten my house and I've gotten my life and I've gotten things ready. But now, I want you to just shine the light, the candle, into my heart. And see if there's anything there that keeps me from having a perfect relationship with you. See if there's anything that, that I need to confess. Anything that I need to change in my life. Search me, O oh God, and know my ways. I want us just to take a couple of moments and just bow together and do that. Because we know it is by the blood that we've been redeemed. It's nothing that we do it's not in keeping the law. It's not in being good people. It's not in being church members. It is not being in being obedient. It is trusting in our Messiah. It is His salvation. It is not our righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. It is His righteousness that we take on. So oh, let's just bow before him in our quietness and you approach the Lord. Father, we are so grateful. We are so blessed. Father, we don't really even understand the richness 
of your blessings. Lord, we see a glimpse of the world around us. And we know that many in our world are, are hurting. Lord, we know that sin is rampant. We know that many Christians around the world are being persecuted. We know, Lord, that Satan is alive and well, roaming to and fro to see whom he may devour. And Father, you've taught us that our adversary has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, Father, we stand on your truth. We recognize the great deliverance that you've brought. We see even from the story of the exodus of the redemption. We see in the picture of the blood on the doorpost the shedding of the lamb has brought us to understand that Yeshua, Jesus, died for our sins. We rejoice, we celebrate, and yet we come before you in awe and say, Lord, search our hearts. Father, we want to be your people. Father, we want to be clean and pure. We want your Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to touch our lives and to change us, to bring us to a place that we are the people that you've called us to be, the light in this community, that the light of Yeshua, the light that has come into the darkness and has changed who we are, be set free. Now, Father, we just thank you for your blood that was shed on Calvary. And bless us now as we worship you. For we humbly pray in the name of Yeshua. Amen.
Savior and friend, how can my praises ever find it? Through years unknown, I'm heaven sure, my song shall praise Him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see Him on Calvary. All sin is bleeding, blinded and weeping, dying for me. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, sings now I see Him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, all sin is bleeding, blinded and weeping, dying for me. Precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners bleeding, blinding and healing, dying for me. Praise you, Father, for taking my place. i 
sets free is free indeed. Who the sun sets free. having fun let him hear you praise him some more Amen. cuz our God reigns
God reigns. Praise you, Father. All glory, all praise.
Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Enjoy fellowship if you get your thank you.